At the 2013 Oncology Practice Summit in Las Vegas, Dr. Joyce O'Shaughnessy spoke with Dr. Lee Schwartzberg about emerging molecular biomarkers in breast cancer. You talked about emerging molecular markers in breast cancer and subtypes of breast cancer. Maybe you could summarize a little bit of what you talked about. It's a very uh, interesting time because we're just at the very earliest stages of trying to match the genotype of these cancers with the phenotype of the patient. And, but the, the missing link right now for a lot of these markers is what's the proven clinical utility of the treatment that you would give the patient as a result of the molecular marker. And um, probably the one that's the furthest along is, is KI-67. And there is a lot of emerging data that, for example, if you were to give um, an anti-estrogen medication, let's say an aromatase inhibitor, preoperatively, and the patient uh, was on it three, four months, went to surgery, and had a very, very low KI-67, you know, well under 5%, um, that that patient may not need chemotherapy, and there's gonna be a randomized prospective study to look at that important hypothesis. Um, patients who have high KI-67s, for example, have the highest pathologic complete response rates, for example, so that person may be an excellent candidate for preoperative chemotherapy. So there's still more, more work, certainly, that needs to be done, but um, it is reasonable to consider KI-67 on some patients. The, the limitation on KI-67 is be, between different pathology laboratories, there could be a different methodology of um, assay KI-67, and there are international efforts going on right now to try to harmonize the way that that is done. But nonetheless, outside of ERPR and HER2, the KI-67 is sort of next up, if you will, as um, a marker of clinical utility. Frankly, all the other markers right now are fascinating and there are hypotheses. Um, some of them are being put into phase three trials, but there really isn't anything of proven clinical utility at this moment. And the only other point that we discussed was that there, are, there is the opportunity now to send uh, our paraffin tissues from the primary or the metastatic lesion to laboratories for broad genome sequencing, you know, for example. And that actually can be useful for our metastatic patients who are looking to enroll and travel, leave their family and travel for a clinical trial that might be helpful. And I think the point that uh, clinical utility is critical now, we're moving into an era of personalized medicine and oncology or precision oncology. And in order to do that, we have to have tests that are validated. We have to understand which tests we should order. We have to understand the context of those tests and having a mutation in one disease or even one subtype in breast cancer may have different implications as it does in another subtype. And we have to understand reimbursement issues around that and uh, have uh, a dialogue with the payers, with the manufacturers, with the oncologists, so that we're all on the same page as to what's important for our patients. And clearly what's important for our patients is getting information that we can use that's clinically actionable and put it into practice today with drugs that are available or into clinical trials. Uh, what is the latest thinking about triple negative breast cancer and what we do, particularly as it relates to different subgroups? Um, I think there are mainly three that we can identify that we can get even some hypotheses on at this moment, you know, for, for clinical trials or for some possibly some caveats for the, for the clinic. We, do know that there is a uh, subgroup of the triple negatives that are exquisitely sensitive to uh, platinum. At um, San Antonio, Steve Isakoff from the Dana, uh, from MGH had a study that was done by the TBCRC showing that uh, seven percent of the patients with triple negative breast cancer who received uh, platinum in these patients ended up being first line patients and they received either cisplatin or carboplatin, there was a 7% of them had multi-year CRs, you know, um, off all therapy, et cetera. So there's a small group and um, our challenge is how do we find them? We, uh, there are some biomarker studies coming along to see if we can identify them. Clinically, um, I try to figure out who they are by the CAS 67 because we know that the really um, exquisite basils to platinum are very fast growing. So the, these are the KI-67s of 80, 90, 100%. And they tend to 
uh, recur in a parenchymal lung pattern or mediastinal lymph nodes. And so if you have somebody who's progressed through ACT with that particular pattern, it's very reasonable to bring in a carbo, uh, carbo or a cisplatin-based regimen. But then our patients who recur pretty quickly, they're showing a lot of signs of drug resistance right away. You know, it's liver disease or, you know, pleural disease, chest wall disease. These are, are not the patients that clinically seem to benefit from platinum. The preclinical work would suggest PI3 kinase inhibition is going to be critical there. Lovely work from um, Veselga's lab showing that a combination of HER1, HER3 blockade plus PI3 kinase blockade is, looks very, very good. Um, and then lastly, the last group are the androgen receptor positive. Um, and the ones that are more mesenchymal where the PI3 kinase strategy um, is important. Um, the work from Pete and Paul and, and colleagues at Vanderbilt suggests that those have intermediately high 30, 50 percent Ki67s. The luminal apocrine, those that are androgen receptor positive, have the lowest Ki67. Those are 20, 25 percent or less. You know, and there's some data. One, one phase two trial showing that um, the 12 percent of triple negatives that have the androgen receptor positive have a 21 percent clinical benefit rate from biclutamide, but they mostly have um, activated PI3 kinase mutations, and so we need we need more trials to put PI3 kinase inhibitors or mTOR inhibitors together with uh, biclutamide-like agents. So the building blocks are coming, but it's still very early. We don't have proven biomarkers to subset the triple negatives that are actionable today, I'd say. The question of platinum in the adjuvant or preoperative setting is, is tough, because we'd all like to see that level one evidence. You know, in fact, the CALGB William Sykoff's trial, I believe, will be presented potentially even at ASCO, I've been told, that that's the preoperative ACT with or without carboplatin. It also has a bevacizumab question in there as well. And that's going to be helpful. The, the, the problem, and that's a triple negative population, the issue is platinum's not going to work for all triple negatives. And so um, will there be a biomarker coming out? And of course, as you can imagine, that's a biomarker heavy study, you know, and so will there be a biomarker um, coming out? What I do is if a patient has a BRCA1 mutation, and um, I, for example, two women immediately, one had three positive notes, and she, uh, she unfortunately had already had her surgery, so we didn't have that as the biomarker response, right? Because if I knew she was a path CR with ACT, I'm not going to give her platinum, you know. Um, if she's nearly a path CR, I mean, a beautiful response to ACT, and she still has residual disease, and she's a BRCA mutation, yes, I'm going to give her four cycles of cisplatin at 75 postoperatively. But sometimes, if they've already had their surgery, we don't have their tumor response as a as a biomarker. And in her case, I did not. And um, what I used there was the CLGB regimen. I said, okay, I'm going to give you AC followed by the paclitaxel carboplatin, just like they're doing it in the um, in the CLGB. I've got a 26-year-old with a no negative but a T2 BRCA1 related breast cancer. I've struggled on her because she's no negative. You know, uh, at the end of the day, I'm putting the nickel down. I'm giving her. I'm adding the platinum to the uh, regimen for her as well. Um, in the non uh, BRCA. I'm finding, as I do these genome sequencing things, because for clinical trials, I'm finding a number of patients that have mutations in the accessory proteins that work with the BRCA1, BRCA2, just recently, like last week, uh, a mutation of BRIP1 and another one of PALB2. So I'm finding these things, and these are BRCA-like cancers, you know? They're, um, and so, um, in patients, but I'm not doing that up front, I'm not doing that up front, but if they have family histories that suggest that even if they're BRCA1, 2 negative, they've got family histories. Um, if they respond, I really like to see response because, you know, platinums don't work in patients who are absolutely refractory to ACT. They just don't work, you know. And so I like to see um, really good responses preoperatively and just a little bit of residual disease, and I'll consider a platinum. I'm really, to, will tell you, outside of the BRCA1 situation, I'm not adding platinums to um, ACT in the adjuvant setting. I'm not, when I'm shooting blind in the adjuvant setting, I'm not adding it outside of a BRCA1 setting. So as you can see, there's a lot of exciting developments in breast cancer as we refine subgroups and as we have molecular subtypes in order to target therapies more and more and benefit patients specifically with a personalized approach. This is Lee Schwartzberg from the Community Oncology Summit. Thank you.